Hey, hello and welcome everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, welcome to our Linkso Wednesday classes. My name is Can and this class is being recorded and the recorded link will be emailed after the class. So look forward to that. Um, and you can also find the recorded class under Linkso's community resources page. Um, our past classes are posted and this class will be posted um, hopefully by tomorrow. So look, look forward to that. Um, if you're having audio issues, I know some folks did in the last seminar, uh, feel free to click on the Zoom link um, that I shared via chat and you can do join directly from that. Uh, today we have two wonderful organizations talking about IPM. So let's please welcome Charlotte from Our Water, Our World and then Paige from Flows to Bay. Thank you so much. I'm Paige and I'm from Close to Bay and I'm so excited to be part of this webinar and really thank Linkso for having myself and Charlotte. Um, so I, next slide please Charlotte. An exciting occurrence with this webinar is that we will be having a random drawing for folks who are attending attending. Uh, but in order to be entered to win, uh, you'll need to uh, fill out a quick post webinar survey. And you must be a resident of San Mateo County to be eligible. And that's where uh, Flow Bay is based. Uh, so I'll be sending out that link at the end of the webinar. And we'll actually have two winners and it will be a $50 gift card to link. So to help you with your IPM plan that you'll learn all about what to do at this webinar today. And even though only San Mateo County residents are eligible for the raffle, we would really love any and all feedback uh, for you um, for this survey. And uh, there will also be a link to that survey that's sent out in the post uh, webinar email uh, from Linkso. Uh, next slide, please. So I just wanted to introduce you all to what Flows to Bay is in case you aren't familiar. Um, we really encourage residents to reduce their pesticide usage and opt for less toxic options when working in the garden or dealing with pests. And Flosa Bay is the San Mateo Countywide Water Pollution Prevention Program, and it was established to reduce and prevent pollution that's carried by stormwater into local creeks, our bay, and the Pacific Ocean. Next slide, please. The program aims to educate the community and do what we can to prevent stormwater pollution. This includes working with residents, businesses, and schools, and just really getting the word out about what watershed protection is. Next slide, please. So real quick, for folks who don't know what a watershed is, um, it's the land that, flow, that, water flows, that water flows over, that's a tough twister um, or through on its way to a water body such as a creek, bay, or ocean. And as you know, San Mateo County is really unique that we really have all those different types of water bodies around us. Unlike other, um, areas that might just have a certain creek or um, that we also have the San Francisco Bay. So essentially a watershed is a funnel and it takes uh, water that falls on the land and then carries it to these larger waterways. And what's really amazing about watersheds is that every person lives in one, no matter where you are in the world, because everything is connected. And um, anything that happens in that watershed does affect the local water quality and whatever lives in that water. So that habitat is what affects fish, birds, and other living things, and also humans, because we also live in that watershed and really rely on that local water quality as well. Next slide, please. So we really can't have this talk without talking about storm drains and how they play a role in watershed protection and stormwater pollution. So San Mateo County has a separate sewer and storm drain system. And that means that the water that flows down into the storm drains goes directly into our water bodies untreated. So there's no like cleaning or filtration process. Whereas when you have your internal plumbing that's inside your homes, 
those enter a sewer system and that gets piped through a wastewater treatment plant and that water is treated. And there are municipal municipalities out there that have a combined drainage system and that includes our neighbors in San Francisco. But remember for us in San Mateo County, our storm drain water is not treated, but our um, pipes and our sewer systems are. So that's where they differ. Next slide, please. So why is that important? It's because um, any water, whether that be from irrigation, sprinklers, rainwater, all that water that travels across hard surfaces picks up whatever it comes along with on the way there and then it ends into our storm drain, and then it flows into our creeks, the San Francisco Bay and Pacific Ocean. So we really have to look out for certain pollutants that may enter our storm drains and then go through that system that then enters our local water bodies. So you might wanna look out for pet waste, automobile fluids and emissions, and also other sources like litter that are on the ground chemicals and solvents that are in soaps for car washing, and of course, pesticides and fertilizers, which folks might use in their garden. So as we know, all of these pollutants will eventually end up in our waterways, but that's why we're here today to discuss less toxic actions you could take in your garden to really prevent that from becoming stormwater pollution and then impacting our waterways. So with that, I'm happy to introduce our integrated pest management advocate and presenter to the Zoom stage, Ms. Charlotte, take it away. Hi everyone, thank you Paige and thank you Can for having us, having me today. Um, and thank you Paige, especially for giving that overview. It's always important to have the big picture when we're, uh, you know, we're not just in our gardens, we're part of an ecosystem. So thank you for that, that view for all of us. So today I'm going to be talking through in, um, slides for about an hour, it might go a little bit longer than an hour, and then we'll have time at the end for your questions and you're welcome to drop your questions in the Q&A. Um, and I guess the chat, I think uh, Paige and Ken will be monitoring that as well throughout the presentation. We're not going to be able to answer all of your questions today, but I'll share my contact info with you at the end that you're welcome to always reach out with any pest or gardening questions. So what we're going to learn today is what is IPM, Integrated Pest Management. We're going to learn how to apply it in the garden and the home, mostly in the garden today. Um, and then why working with an IPM approach is going to automatically lead you to have less pests. And then at the end, we're going to talk, actually it's more, it's most of the presentation, we're going to talk um, specific management strategies for specific common pests that we're probably, uh, many of us are dealing with right now. And uh, it's going to be, just to give you a preview, it's going to be aphids, whitefly, citrus leaf miner, leaf miner, um, weeds, some fungal diseases, rats, and gophers, just to give you an idea of what to look forward to. <laughs> and before I begin, I just want to introduce the Our Water, Our World program. Uh, it's a program designed to bring awareness between pesticides and water quality, exactly what Paige was discussing already. Um, and we provide pest solving um, education. So we partner with um, many uh, hardware stores and nurseries and garden centers throughout uh, 23 counties in, the, in California. And we're in over 200 hardware stores and nurseries. Um, what you'll find in most stores is a, a fact sheet rack, like in the photo on the left. It's just a rack with um, fact sheets about common pests that you might have. You're welcome to take any of that information. You can also find those fact sheets in PDF form um, on ourwaterourworld.org. Also in the stores, some stores you might also see these blue tags on the shelves that are going to highlight the eco-friendly products um, available to you. And um, I just I meant to say that in, in San Mateo County, we partner with 10 stores, including four Home Depots and four Hassett Hardwares and Linkso, of course. Um, and then, of course, you can find a list of all of the stores that we do partner with throughout other counties and the fact sheets and a list of less toxic products on the website as well. 
So first we're gonna start with a poll and Paige is gonna launch that and give, we'll to give you about a minute to um, complete this poll. And the question is, are you familiar with integrated pest management or IPM? We'll give you all about around 10 more seconds to get your vote cast in. Okay, we'll be ending the poll. And this all right. is the results. And it seems it's the 50-50 split almost, <laughs> a little bit more no's than yeses. So that's good. Um, I'm glad some people are familiar and some people are new. So we um, are going to learn. For those of you who do know, it's going to be a review. And for those of you who don't know, it's um, you're going to learn about it. So what is Integrated Pest Management, IPM for short? It is a science-based decision-making process. It's um, a way of looking at the garden or the home uh, more as a whole, as an ecosystem. And it requires asking a lot of questions before taking any actions. So um, our main, our big question is what are we even looking at? Because a lot of times we'll see damage um, and we'll, we won't know what's causing that damage. A lot of damage or a lot of damage can come from a lot of different pests. Leaf chewing uh, can be mice, birds, caterpillars, you know, uh, insects, all kinds of snails, kind, all kinds of things. So we really want to identify, know what we're looking at, uh, what really is the problem. And then we're going to ask, can we live with it? A lot of um, a lot of pest problems are either short-lived or they're just more of a nuisance. So maybe we can just, you know, wait till it dies off. Pests are tend to be seasonal, so maybe we can just tolerate it. But if there are some pests that are causing some really bad damage, we are going to want to take some action. And when we do take action, there are um, some different kinds of steps we can take. In IPM, they're called controls, and they're, they fall into about four categories. So there's cultural controls, which is really bolstering the health of the environment, the garden, um, really creating healthy plants and a, a less healthy environment for, your, for pests. And then there's mechanical controls, which are really physical tools that we can use in the garden to keep pests away from things that we don't want them to get to. Then there's biological controls, which is really harnessing the power of our good bugs, our birds, other critters in the garden out in the world to help manage pests for us. And then lastly, there's chemical controls. These are pesticides and we're always gonna use them as a last resort and always um, as little as possible and eco-friendly as possible. And here's just um, a, an image to better um, explain the IPM process. Um, number three is prevent, which I usually put prevent as number one because we can do a lot of things uh, before uh, pests arrive to prevent pests from coming. So really thinking ahead with prevention. So that's number one, in my opinion. Then when pests do arrive, we're gonna properly identify and monitor if it's getting worse. We're gonna evaluate do we need to take action or can we let it go? Then we're gonna take some actions if we decide that we need to. Um, again, we'll go through our cultural, mechanical, biological, and chemical. And then we're, again, we can't forget to monitor. After we take action, we need to monitor. Did the population go down or do we need to try something else um, to see if we can help that population decrease? So first is prevention. And um, prevention can look, take a lot of different forms. So um, what tools can be implemented? If you know you're in a deer prone area, just putting up a deer fence will, you know, ahead of time before you even see deer or have any deer problems, that's gonna be a way to uh, prevent pest problems, of course, or pl any planting any new plants in gopher baskets. Uh, we'll talk more about gophers later, but putting them in the gopher baskets before you might have any gopher problems, that's gonna prevent um, any headaches with those plants. 
timing of management action. So understanding when pests are likely to come out, when the time, best time is to, um, to tackle them. So yellow jackets, it's a really good idea to get your yellow jacket traps out very early in the season. That way you can hopefully catch the queen. If you catch the queen, your population is gonna decrease dramatically throughout the summer. Correct water and fertilizing management. This is, we're gonna talk more about this later, but too much water, too little water can really stress out a plant. So just focusing on the health of your plant up front is gonna prevent a lot of pest issues going forward. And then good sanitation, keeping the garden clean. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about that later. That's all preventative measures that we can um, take into consideration when we're gardening. And then there's the identification of the pests. So we really need to properly identify what's going on in our garden. Um, and there's a few reasons why. 90% of the bugs we see in the garden are actually good bugs. So we wanna make sure if we see a bug on our plant, we're not immediately like, ah, let's get it. It's let's figure out what it is. It could be a good thing. It could be a good bug helping us keep pests down in the garden. Also, we want to be able to understand the life cycle. If we know what we're looking at, we understand how it grows, when the damage occurs, and when's the best time to manage it. Pest habitat and timing, if we know what we're looking at, or we know that we have a plant that's susceptible to a certain pest, we can take actions to uh, lessen the effects of that pest as much as possible. Um, for example, you know, aphids, we're gonna talk about aphids um, a little, little bit, but they come out in spring. So when we're prepared uh, for aphids and we understand when they're coming, we can take some actions to prevent them. And then identification is also important because we wanna understand if there are natural enemies for that pests. And if they are already in our garden, we wanna make sure we're nurturing them or we're not gonna harm them. And just to another point to stress the importance, uh, that worm or caterpillar on the screen is a, a um, black swallowtail butterfly caterpillar. It looks very similar to many pest caterpillars like a tomato hornworm. Um, so again, we wanna make sure that we, are, we know what we're looking at. So first we're gonna talk about, so the rest we're gonna talk about the different controls and what they mean. So first we're gonna talk about cultural controls. Cultural controls and prevention are very similar because it's all about focusing on healthy plants and healthy gardens. So um, again, if we focus on healthy soil, that'll lead to healthy plants and less pest problems overall. So ways to create a healthy garden and healthy soil is to use compost. Compost is an amazing um, tool and ingredient that we can use in our garden. Um, it's decomposed organic matter. We can either make our own compost or we can buy compost pre-made. Pre Linkso does sell compost and they have a fantastic article um, that uh, actually explains how which compost might be best for your garden and um, which plants might need certain kinds of compost. And I think Ken will link that in the chat for you all. So what does compost do for the garden? It improves your soil structure. So um, it really, it increases. So if you have, see, let me see, let me back up. If you have sandy soil, it's going to really glue those sand particles together and allow your, sand to um, be a little stickier, hold water better, and hold nutrients better. Whereas if you have clay soil, it's going to kind of break up those particles, increase airflow, increase water um, infiltration, increase the space for roots and organisms to go into your soil. So it actually can help both extremes of your soil um, improve. With that, it increases water retention. Compost can hold five times its weight in water. So when you add it to soil, to your garden soil, it's just increasing that spongy quality um, of your soil to really hold on to water. Super important as we're approaching the summer and drought conditions. It also increases the microbiology in the soil. So compost is super rich in bacteria, fungus, and invertebrates, and adding it to your soil is gonna in, um, inoculate your soil with that good microbiology. And compost can actually filter out 
um, stormwater pollutants. So when rain or um, runoff does run into your garden that has that rich compost in it, 60 to 90% of uh, urban pollutants are actually gonna be filtered out before that water reaches aquifers deep down below. And then back to that microbiology, so, so essential for your soil and for your plants. Your plants cannot live or survive if there's not life in the soil. And we really wanna focus on good bacteria and good fungi and invertebrates in the soil. Um, this quote that I love from Teeming with Microbes, this book that I have, it's called, it says, sorry, I can't see it right now. Um, a mere teaspoon of good garden soil contains a billion invisible bacteria, several yards of invisible fungal hyphae, several thousand protozoa, and a few dozen nematodes. And that's just in one teaspoon of soil. So we, it's really important to uh, nurture that life. Um, that life allows your plants to take up nutrients and water. Um, it's very similar to our stomachs, our, our guts. Our gut microbiome breaks down what we eat, the organic material, the food that we're eating. It breaks it down and it processes it in a way that we can take up those nutrients. Same exact thing is happening in the soil. The bacteria and fungi are processing the organic material added to the soil through compost and fertilizer and um, just general leaves and other things breaking down and it feeds it to our plants when the plant wants and needs it. And another um, thing to just um, point out this picture right here. So there's the plant roots, but then there's that fuzzy white stuff coming off the plant roots. Those aren't just an extension. Those aren't the roots. That's actually called mycorrhizal fungi. It, what it does is it locks into your plant roots and really just acts as an extension of those roots um, so that your plant has access to nutrients and water much further away. And there, it's really acting as an exchange that fungi, fungus is um, pumping nutrients to your plant. Your plant is feeding that um, fungus and bacteria sugars through the process of photosynthesis. It's really an amazing, um, symbiotic relationship happening down under the soil and we need to nurture it. So other ways to build that healthy soil and keep your soil very healthy is to use mulch. And when I'm talking about mulch, so mulch is really anything that's used to cover the soil. So it can be made of a lot of different things. There's rubber mulch, uh, oyster shells, gravel. But what I'm really talking about is organic mulches. So these are bark, wood chips, straw, um, things that are made of organic materials that are going to break down. And Linkso does sell at least 10, uh, 10 um, kinds of mulches at, that, at their store. So you can read more about those different kinds and what they can do for your soil. But mulch is really important because uh, one, it really, it keeps weeds down. So that's really important if we are dealing with weeds. It covers the soil so it keeps weeds from germinating. As it breaks down those organic mulches, they're a nice carbon material, they're gonna break down in the soil, which will feed the soil organisms. And it saves water, again, as we're facing summer and warmer temperatures coming, we really wanna save as much water in our soil as possible. So that layer of material on top of your soil is gonna really um, uh, reduce evaporation. Um, and then it reduces soil compaction and erosion by adding that squishy la uh, layer to the soil. So it's, um, the soil is not going to get smushed and it's going to keep that soil on place. So in the wind and the rain, the soil stays on site. And it acts like a little blanket. It keeps the soil cool in the summer, warm in the winter, which is important because your plants do, um, your plant roots don't really need, like those big temperature swings. So as much insulation you can offer them to keep their, um, the temperature more regulated is gonna be better for them. And just last thing to note on the mulch is that we, especially with trees and shrubs, we always wanna keep um, mulch away from the crown of the plant, which is the part of the plant where the um, above ground parts and the below ground parts meet right at the soil surface. You do want to keep mulch away from that area, at least six inches, um, so that because if it's right up against the plant, it's going to invite uh, moisture and fungal diseases. So we really want to keep that clear. 
And then we have organic fertilizers. And I'm going to stress we want to use organic fertilizers. So if you do need to, if you do want to add additional nutrients to your soil in addition to your compost, um, organic fertilizers are wonderful for this. Um, organic fertilizers are made from organic materials. So they can be made from kelp, uh, fish parts, uh, manure, other compost, other just um, uh, byproducts and other materials. Um, whereas synthetic fertilizers or non-organic fertilizers are made from, uh, they can be made from fossil fuels and other um, less sustainable uh, materials. Um, organic fertilizers will feed the soil and this is really important differentiation between organics and synthetics. So organic fertilizers, they are added to the soil and they feed the soil organisms actually. We're not necessarily feeding, feeding the plant with these fertilizers. We're feeding the soil organisms. And again, those soil organisms are then gonna feed, process those nutrients, feed our plants what the plant wants. Um, and whereas synthetic fertilizers kind of act like steroids for plants, they really inject those, the plants with um, an intense amount of nutrients, usually high nitrogen, that the plant necessarily doesn't want, it's not ready for, and it will cause a lot of stress. It might cause a lot of growth, but it'll also cause a lot of stress. So what we want is slower released nutrients over time, which will lead to hardier, sturdier plants. And organic fertilizers will not run off into local waterways, whereas synthetic fertilizers can run off. And when they do, they can uh, build up, they can cause algae blooms and other toxic environments for, um, for uh, our marine life and for us eventually. And then another thing to think about in cultural controls when you're planting is right plant, right place. So we do live, in, or for those of you, I know there's some people in Australia out there and some in New York, some other places. Um, if you're in California though, in the Bay Area, we do live in a very unique climate. We um, live, it's a, a Mediterranean climate with mild wet winters, well, hopefully wet, not always wet, um, wetter winters and hot dry summers. So we want to um, focus on plants that are um, suited for that unique environment. So California natives and Mediterranean plants are gonna adapt well to this climate. So beyond living in the Bay Area, we really wanna understand uh, our yards. So um, yards can even have their own microclimates. So we really wanna study our yard um, we want to understand what's going on. You, there's, there might be a shady lower spot that gets a lot of, um, not a lot of sun and a lot of moisture or a very hot spot next to a fence. We really want to study the yard, make sure we're choosing plants and putting plants in the right spots with just even within our yards. If we do have plants that are, or if we know that we have a lot of certain pests or diseases in the area. If you have talked to your neighbors, they deal with a certain kind of pests a lot. Maybe when we're buying plants, we're going to uh, look for resistant varieties. And then again, those when the plant is happy in the right spot, it's going to be more water efficient and it's going to be automatically less stressed and stressed plants again, invite pests. And I did just wanna remind everyone these little plant tags that you see when you have, when you go to the nursery, they have a lot of information on there. The light needs, the water needs, the space needs. Space is really important and we tend to forget. Hopefully plants grow. If we're doing everything right, plants are going to grow. We need to allow them to have that space or they're also going to be stressed if they're in too small of a spot. So read this. You can always ask your very knowledgeable nursery staff as well for, for questions. And here is three um, resources that we can share with you later as well. Um, great plant lists if you are in this area to, to look at. There's the Basco plant lists that um, have like lists of whatever you're looking for. If you're looking for pollinator plants or for a lawn substitute, they have separate lists for that. There is the Yerba Buena California Native Plant Society um, that has uh, native plants that will work well in this um, area. And then this UC Arboretum All-Stars, which actually has a searchable database that can really 
help you find out find what you're looking for. And we can share these uh, later with you. And then a few more notes on the cultural controls. Water is really important <laughs> to uh, healthy plants because too little or too much water is going to stress your plant out. Um, and too much or, or inconsistent or incorrect watering is actually like the number one cause of, um, of plants dying or being unsuccessful. So it's really important to take this into consideration. And when you're planting, when you're studying your yard and you're planting your plants, you wanna focus on planting plants together that have the same water needs. Um, this will lead to overall less stressed out plants. And it's actually gonna to lead to less uh, stress and work for you if you really only have to water one section of your garden frequently instead of dragging your hose all over the garden every day. Um, it's gonna make your life easier as well. It's called hydrozoning, planting plants together with the same water needs. Also remembering sun, shade, wind, heat, um, making sure they're all suited to that area as well. And one last note on water, um, because again, watering does lead to stress or, or to healthy plants if done correctly. We wanna remember a few things when we're watering. Watering deeply and infrequently is really important to help draw the roots deep down. Um, remembering new plants do need a lot more water than established plants, so taking that into consideration. But either way, we're gonna water deeply so the water goes now deep into our soil, which will draw the roots down deep into the soil. And then we're gonna let the surface of the soil dry out, one or two inches dry out before we water again. That will ensure that we're not over watering and having over watering our plant and our plant is not sitting in soggy water or soggy soil, excuse me. Um, and then that just, this image on the right just shows the difference between, you know, watering, deeply and infrequently, whereas if we're watering frequently but shallow, those roots are really gonna stay near the so surface of the soil. Is that right? Okay, <laughs> surface of the soil. And um, that's where the water evaporates most quickly. So you're gonna have really, um, your roots are gonna be very susceptible to drought and drier conditions. So if you really wanna get them down deep where that water is. And then, um, sanitation, again, is both a preventative and a cultural control. So removing, um, we're harvesting our food crops, we're picking up fallen fruits and nuts just to avoid attracting pests like yellow jackets and rodents. We're cleaning up any fungal, fungal spores, any diseased plant parts should be pruned out immediately and not put in our compost pile. They should go into either the green bin if you have one of those or put in your black bin. And then um, keeping a clean garden will also help you monitor. Um, it's always good to you know, take a garden walk out there monitoring for um, pests and other problems when you're out there. All right, we're gonna move on to mechanical controls. So all of those were cultural controls, ways of bolstering the health of the garden, ways that your garden, if you have a healthy garden, will lead to less pests. So, but other options for us, mechanical controls. Now these are the physical tools and barriers that we can use both in the home and the garden. Big, definitely for the home, we wanna keep pests out with hardware cloth, door sweeps, caulk, uh, the sheet metal corners on the, um, the bottom right there keeps mice out of a garage. All of those tools will keep insects, roaches, mice, and rodents out of our homes. And then in the garden, there's um, row covers. Just hosing your plant off is an excellent tool and it's very non-toxic and very effective actually. And that's a mechanical control. And then our weeding tools, any kind of weed whacker, hand tools, hori horis, cultivators, those can all be very effective um, controls for weeds. And then we have our barriers. So uh, into the ones that we use in our home, we have barriers that we can use in the garden. And this could be row cover, which is that middle photo, that uh, floating white material. It still lets air and water in and light in, but it does keep uh, flying 
uh, either birds and flying insects out. Um, very helpful for a lot of different pest issues. There's um, bird netting, uh, which you can put over your fruit trees to prevent birds and sometimes squirrels even from getting your fruit. It is helpful if you do keep your tree, your fruit and nut trees small. Um, it's, it'll be a lot easier to work with the bird netting. Um, I have heard that sometimes birds do get stuck in the bird netting and that can be quite um, upsetting, I guess the word would be, um, and unfortunate. So I do recommend if you do use bird netting that you check uh, the, the net frequently for any animals that might get stuck in it. Then there's uh, gopher baskets, which I've already mentioned and I'm gonna to touch on again, because they're so important. If you do live in the Bay Area, if you don't have gophers yet, you're bound to get them soon enough. Um, I'm sure neighbors have them. They're pretty much everywhere in the Bay Area. So any new planting should go in a gopher basket. And they, they gopher baskets are designed to prevent gophers. So um, look for that. Or you can use half inch hardware cloth. And then there's copper tape barriers that you can use for snails and slugs. And again, deer fencing uh, has to be seven feet tall to keep out deer. Uh, more uh, barriers in the garden, exclusion frames, fencing, and baskets. This is really important for um, if you have rodent problems or bird problems. This is really, well, not necessarily bird problems for everything, but um, it could help with that, uh, especially rodents. Uh, you're gonna wanna use quarter inch hardware cloth uh, the middle picture on the top is a fancy custom frame um, that was built for a garden in San Francisco that had major rat problems. It has a nice frame that you can lift up and still work in there, um, but it's lined with quarter inch hardware cloth. That's the size that you want to use um, because rats and mice can fit through a hole the size of a pencil, mice and small rats that is. So you really want to use quarter inch hardware cloth for that. Um, but they do, there are these exclusion cages that you can put over individual plants on the bottom right. Uh, fencing can keep some um, rodents out as well. And then that up that uh, in the top left, that's more for birds. The holes are definitely too big for rodents, but that could keep birds out from eating um, some plants. I definitely have bird problems in my own yard. I basically cover everything, all my seedlings, especially with uh, like a chicken wire or even, I've even used like a little plastic strawberry basket upside down over a seedling just to keep the birds out. They just tear up the seedlings. It's pretty upsetting. <laughs> but there's lots of, there's lots of ways to do, to make exclusion frames that don't necessarily have to be fancy and custom made like that middle one. And then working with traps, these are also mechanical controls. So um, uh, there's lots of, you know, you can trap lots of different critters and lots of different pests. There's um, the roach traps, which are just sticky traps you leave in your, have in your house, gopher traps, mouse and uh, rodent traps, yellow jacket or fly traps are very effective. Uh, they are a little smelly. So if you can put them further away from your, your back door, that's probably gonna be better for you. And then there's sticky insect traps that are often used as indicators actually, really just to help monitor if you do have those pests. They can help trap as well. Um, they, a lot of times they have hormones or pheromones on them or there are certain colors to attract uh, very specific kinds of pests. And then you can even create uh, what the, the image on the left is a snail or a slug trap. It's just a board lifted up a little bit off the ground. Snails and slugs like darkness and they don't like the heat of the day. So in the heat of the day, they might go under this board and you can lift it up and then just scrape them into some soapy water to kill them. All right, and then we're gonna move on to our biological controls. And this is all about um, in in beneficial insects, pollinators, and other uh, understanding the other garden allies in the that we have out in the ecosystem. So we're going to focus on for beneficial insects. We're going to focus on our three P's: the pollinators, the predators, and the parasitic insects. So the pollinators, which are bees and butterflies, that are going to pollinate. We need them in our gardens if we're going to have tomatoes or other uh, fruit. We need them to pollinate our plants for us. 
There's predators like spiders, ladybugs or lady beetles, lace wings. They eat aphids, thrips, um, scale, and uh, white flies, lots of, other, lots of other pests as well. And then there's parasitic insects. There's parasitic wasps that are teeny tiny little wasps that will like lay their eggs on a caterpillar and the, when the eggs hatch, they kind of devour the caterpillar from the inside. It's pretty gross, but very effective um, uh, pest control that we don't have to deal with. So um, it's very helpful to keep them around. And remembering that 90% of the bugs in the garden are good bugs. Good bugs or beneficial bugs tend to be, um, are actually around most of the year. Again, depending on where you live, if you're in a mild climate like uh, the Bay Area, they're, they're mostly year round, whereas pests are seasonal. So we really wanna focus on nurturing those year round good bugs. Um, there is this, I just wanted to post, point out this brochure on the, on the screen called the 10 most wanted bugs in the garden. That brochure can be found at ourwaterourworld.org. And it just talks about 10 bugs that we really want to, that are common in the garden. We want to nurture how to invite them in. So we're going to choose plants, more about how to invite them in. We're going to choose plants that will attract those beneficials. And what we're going to do is we're going to focus on planting diverse diversity. Um, and plants that they like are uh, plants like yarrow, ceanothus, plants with tiny clumps or clumps of tiny flowers, not tiny clumps, but clumps of tiny flowers uh, that yarrow they love because it creates a nice flat pad that they can stand on and eat from the, the nectar from all those many flowers. They also like families or uh, flowers like um, daisies or sunflowers, the ones with the little button in the middle and the ray of petals around them. So planting variety and including some of those plants in there will invite in lots of beneficial insects. And again, not spraying pesticides or any harmful chemicals out in the yard will also encourage them. And in addition to our uh, beneficial bugs, we do want to recognize that there are lots of other garden allies out there. So our birds are actually quite helpful for us. 90% uh, of bugs do eat, I'm sorry, 90% of birds do eat bugs at some point in their life. So they can help with our pest control. I do want to um, encourage you to, though to avoid um, bird feeders. I know they're really fun to watch birds at the bird feeders. Bird feeders do, um, though, create a big mess that can also in turn invite squirrels and rodents. Um, and they might actually just give you more of a headache. But to invite in birds, you can have bird baths or um, leave some of, let some of your plants go to seed. Uh, they'll eat those seeds. They'll use some of the older plant material for their nests as well. And then also there's, you know, there's, we live in an ecosystem and we want to encourage it. There's a lot of critters out there that actually, um, you know, keep down our pests. Coyotes eat gophers. Not that we want to invite coyotes into our yard, but understanding that they're part of the system. Pest issues arise when the system is out of balance. So, um, you know, not harming those predators, coyotes, hawks, Owls, bats keep mosquitoes down. Uh, snakes and lizards do eat a lot of bugs as well in the garden. So just keeping those guys in mind when you are out in the garden, especially if you use any uh, traps, bait, or pesticides. And then speaking of pesticides, last um, on our control list are chemical controls. And um, we, in IPM, we always go for the least toxic possible, the most eco-friendly that we can find. And they're actually, we're very lucky. There's a lot of pesticides out there that are more eco-friendly, um, especially on, you know, our regular, you know, stores. We don't have to go anywhere special. Um, a lot of stores do have these products. So we're gonna focus on products like insecticidal soaps and horticulture cultural oils. Oil is also one of those. 
There's botanical pesticides, um, for example, the active ingredient pyrethrins derived from chrysanthemum flower that can be a very helpful insecticide. And then there's biopesticides that are basically naturally occurring bacteria that do target specific uh, pest problems that can be very helpful. Um, for example, Captain Jack's dead brew, there's a product, there's a, the active ingredient is spinosad, which is um, a, a bacteria naturally found in soil that can help with certain insects. Monterey, or not, Bt, excuse me, Bt is a bacteria that targets only caterpillars, and uh, those mosquito dunks are also a uh, bacteria that only target um, mosquito larva. So you can put those in like a, a trough of water if you have horses, super, totally safe for everything else, just kills mosquito larva. So really just taking advantage of these, these um, eco-friendlies. And I just want to clear, um, say in addition that these products um, they're eco-friendly because they break down quickly in the environment. So um, the insecticidal soap, the oil, the pesticides, or the botanical pesticides, we spray them and then within um, a, few a day or a few days, depending on the product, the product is dry and that product is no longer effective and it's no longer, it's just, it's essentially gone and harmless in the environment, whereas the non um, the less friendly, less eco-friendly products do tend to persist in the environment for a long time um, and that they can get into waterways as well. Um, so again, we're always using pesticides as a last resort. We're going to go for the least toxic, most eco-friendly that we can find, really looking for um, narrow, the most narrow spectrum pesticide that we can find. Again, that that uh, those bacteria, as I pointed out, the BT and the mosquito dunks, super narrow spectrum. They only target caterpillars or mosquito larvae. They're not just, you know, it's not like a spray that we just spray and it kills everything in its path. It's very targeted. And we really wanna focus as most targeted as possible. We're always gonna look at the label, that label on the back of the pesticide container. It tells you what pests will uh, this pesticide works for. If your pest that you're targeting is not on the label, you cannot use that pesticide. Um, that's the law. The label's the law. Um, it's again another reason to be very sure of and identifying your uh, pest because if you don't know what you're targeting, you can't choose the right pesticide for it. Also, there are instructions on how to use that pesticide on that label. You want to make sure you're using it correctly. Um, because the label is the law as well. Um, we're always going to wear our PPE, our, our eye covering, maybe a mask, gloves, long sleeves, long shirt, uh, long pants, uh, closed hooded shoes. These, even the eco friendlies, are designed to kill something. So there could be some skin irritation, lung irritation, um, and other 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 unintended risks. So we do want to make sure we're covering up when we're spraying. A few more tips with the uh, pesticides. Uh, remember, less toxic products sometimes can take a little bit longer, especially if you're using like a bait station versus a spray. Bait stations, like for ants, example, for example, bait stations will take a little bit longer, but they're going to kill out the source, whereas sprays are immediate, but you're only spraying the, the ants in front of you. Um, timing is important. So again, understanding what the pest is, when the best time to apply that pesticide. Some pests you can only apply when they're, they're only effective in the larval stage. So you need to know what you're looking at. We're spot treating only. That means we're only spraying the pest when the pest is present. We're not just gonna spray the whole tree just in case, maybe the tree next to it, just in case you know it might migrate over there. We're never gonna use pesticides as a preventative, we're only spraying when the pest is present. There is one exception to that rule when it comes to dormant spraying in the winter time, but we're not, don't need to talk about that now. But other than that one, one occasion, we're never gonna spray when the pest is not there. We're gonna try to, um, we're gonna spray in the evening at dusk. This is a good time because the wind generally dies down um, after at dusk. 
um, the because we don't want it to be windy. We don't want, to, want any rain in the forecast. And also the good bugs tend to be less active um, in the evening. So there's going to be less of a chance that we're going to um, accidentally target them. Um, and then if you are releasing beneficials, which uh, you can buy beneficial insects, I forgot to mention this previous on the previous slide, you can buy beneficial insects. Uh, many garden uh, garden centers and nurseries do sell ladybugs and lace wings and praying mantis. Um, there is also a, a really great resource called Rincon Vitova. Uh, maybe Can can put a link in the chat because it's hard to uh, see. It's hard to understand what I'm saying. Rincon Vitova is a insectary that you can buy um, uh, beneficial insects as well. It is best. Um, well, in kind of it's 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 uh, it's good to encourage them the beneficial insects just naturally into your, your yard by um, planting the plants that they like. But if you do um, release them into your yard, just be patient. There is a chance they're gonna fly away, but there's also a chance they're gonna eat what they need to eat. Um, and if they have enough you know, nectar plants and good habitat, hopefully they'll stick around. Either way, we're gonna make sure if we're releasing beneficials, we're giving them time um, to do their job before we move to the uh, chemical controls. We don't want to spray after we've released beneficials. And um, going back to what Paige mentioned about um, stormwater um, and how you know runoff from the, uh, the sewer just goes right to the bay or go, goes to waterways, excuse me. Um, and when you do the water that goes down your like toilet and your sink in your house does go to the water treatment plant. But um, I do want to remind everyone that synthetic pesticides are not removed at water treatment plants. They are persistent in water. It's just too difficult too expensive to remove pesticides like that from water. So that's why we are never dumping any pesticides down the drain. Um, we're never ever ever doing that because they're going to last in the waterways for eternity, <laughs> essentially, as far as we know. Um, so we're always gonna take our products to household hazardous waste. Um, right now, the San Mateo Household Hazardous Waste is doing um, free, well, it's always free, but they're doing appointments, uh, but it's easy to make an appointment, and there is that website right there um, for you to make that appointment. So that's all of our um, intro to IPM and our cultural, our, all of our controls. We're going to take a poll and then we'll move on to specific pest management. So the, pro the question is, are you currently dealing with any pest problems? Okay, if folks are still voting. We'll have about five more seconds with this vote. Okay. All right. And a lot of yeses. So I'm not surprised. <laughs> well, hopefully the pests that we talk about will help you a little bit and then we'll be able to answer some questions at the end um, and hopefully get your questions answered. All right. So now we're going to look at a few different pests and how to apply IPM techniques to get rid of them. The first is aphids. Um, because uh, while I'm sure many people are dealing with aphids right now, it is spring. Uh, there's uh, many reasons why aphids come out in spring. It's warmer, plants are pushing new growth. That new growth is very attractive to aphids. They like that young, easy to eat, sweet growth. Um, so that's why you're gonna see, always gonna see aphids in spring. 
in our climate, we do tend to see aphids all year round, um, but definitely a lot more in spring. There are many species and varieties, so they do come in different colors. There's uh, red, green, yellow, uh, gray, black, white aphids. Um, some have wings, some don't, and uh, some species only like one kind of plant. Some species will go across different plants as well. And to know, um, so ladybugs are a very common predator of aphids. They do like to eat them. And ants actually like to protect aphids and other, other um, insects as well, because aphids, when they are eating, they leave behind this residue called honeydew. It's a sticky sweet um, material and ants actually like to farm it. So what they're gonna, they don't eat the aphids, but they eat the residue. So um, ants will actually fight off ladybugs and other predators to keep the aphids healthy. So we'll look at ways to taking, knowing that we're gonna look at ways to manage aphids. So because aphids like that new growth, we're going to focus on using organic and slow release fertilizers because we don't want our plants to be pushing out fast new growth um, like crazy to attract lots of, um, to attract lots of pests because again, they'll be stressed and there's gonna be a lot of new growth that those pests like. We're not gonna over prune. Pruning does um, also stimulate new growth. So if you can just uh, prune, to keep the plant healthy, but not if you don't overdo it. Uh, we don't want to push too much new growth. We're going to manage those ants because if we manage ants, we're going to allow the ladybugs to do their job of eating those aphids, like in this picture on the right. So you can manage ants by um, in a few different ways. You can always just um, hose them off, um, or you can use a sticky insect glue like Tanglefoot or um, just any kind of sticky insect glue. If you see them climbing up like a trunk of a tree, you want to wrap the tree uh, with a piece of paper and then put that sticky glue on that piece of paper that will keep the ants as get them stuck as they crawl up. They're all, there are also um, uh, outdoor in, uh, ant baits sometimes you can find. Um, a great quick solution for aphids to start when you first see them, spray them off with a stream of water going to blast a lot of them off. Aphids are sucking insects, so their mouth parts are like little straws. When their mouth parts are in the plant, sucking away, from, sucking up those juices, and they get blasted off with a stream of water, their body goes that way, but their mouth parts stay here, and it kills them. You're not going to kill all the aphids with a strong stream of water, but you are going to knock back the population significantly. Um, you're going to invite ladybugs and other predators um, uh, either by inviting them in, planting what they like, or buying them and releasing them into the yard. But remember, they might come, eat, and then leave. And then if you do want to um, use a chemical control, there are insecticidal soaps and horticultural oils that can be very effective remembering we're spraying um, only where the aphids are when they are present because they need to be coated with these materials. And if you do have a plant, a deciduous plant like a rose, for example, that um, does tend to always have lots of aphid problems in the spring, you might consider dormant sprays, which um, are applied during the winter when there are no leaves on the trees um, and you can, um, it, will, it will smother the overwintering um, aphids and hopefully lessen your population. White flies. So um, white flies are very common. Um, sorry, I lost my thing. <laughs> white flies um, are very common. Uh, they do have lots of natural enemies as well, similar to aphids. They leave behind that honeydew, so ants do protect them as well. They also like that new plant growth, um, very similar to aphids as well. And then they actually can be a sign of overwatering or poor drainage. Oops, skipped ahead. So uh, white fly solutions. So we're gonna, because it can be an indicator of poor um, drainage, we're gonna check irrigation, check your soil, stick your finger in there. Um, it should probably be dry the first uh, top inch or two. 
um, and make sure if you, it's in a pot that the, the drainage holes aren't blocked or anything like that. Um, you can change, you can move the plant around to increase airflow um, because uh, sometimes dusty conditions can also um, help white flies as well. You're gonna wash off the leaves similar to aphids. You're gonna wash the plant off, blast it off with some water. Um, you, there are aphid and white, tra white fly traps that you can use um, to monitor and manage them. Sometimes I've heard that reflective mulch can um, repel white flies. So it doesn't, it can either be like, um, you know, tin foil, something shiny that you put on the, the soil or like, um, like a metallic, any kind of material, okay, uh, you know, wrapping paper, <laughs> um, any kind of metallic thing that can help uh, repel white flies. And then soaps, horticultural soaps um, or insecticidal soaps and horticultural oils like neem can also be effective as well. Again, making sure though that you are not targeting any beneficial insects because uh, white flies do have lots of natural enemies. So we don't wanna target those. Then we have our veggie leaf miner. So um, if you do have, you know, charred beets, spinach, leafy plants like that, uh, you'll probably see some leaf miner damage. Um, like the picture on the left, uh, what they do is the larva will hatch, they're laid in the leaf and when they hatch, they kind of just mine through the layers of the leaf, um, eating the in inner layer and leaving that outer cell layer. Um, uh, with a lot of plants, um, you can kind of just prune them out. Well, we'll get to, well, sorry, I'm jumping ahead. We'll get to our um, controls in just a second. But um, they do overwinter in soil and they show up when the temperatures uh, warm up a bit. So um, because of that, one way to tackle leaf miner is to, if you're in the Bay Area and you have mild winters, you can actually plant these just grow your chard and your beets and your spinach in the winter months because um, they'll do fine depending on the temperatures that you get as long as you're not getting too much frost. Um, and the leaf miners will be less of a problem. You can also, uh, if you're monitoring closely, you can also just prune out the parts of the leaves that you see where you see the first um, bit of damage. Uh, again, like, you know, beets, as long as there's some leafy growth, the bottom's still gonna grow, charred, you know, that's what we're eating. So if they eat the whole, if the whole leaf is damaged, we're just gonna cut out that whole leaf. But it is possible to just cut out parts of it um, to manage the, the leaf miner. Um, blue sticky traps can be indicators. Uh, inspecting leaves for eggs is really important. Um, smashing them, wiping them off, and then as, again, removing the damaged leaves if you are removing the damaged leaves, place them in a paper bag um, and roll up that paper bag and seal it before you put it in your compost bin um, because we don't want the larva to, um, well, the, it to grow wings and fly away. <laughs> um, and, and, or put it in a plastic bag if you're putting it in the trash. Um, and then beneficial nematodes. Um, can be purchased and applied to soil, and they can um, they can be useful in um, getting rid of the eggs before they hatch. And then citrus leaf miner is actually quite a different um, insect, although it has a very similar name. But this is most this is just for citrus. Um, and it's a similar idea, it, the, the, the larva will dig through the layers of the cells of the leaf and cause um, some squiggly damage that you can see on the bottom right. Um, they don't harm, they do like that new growth and they are most harmful for younger citrus plants. They don't really, um, they don't damage older citrus plants over like four years old. Uh, they don't, they, older, more mature plants can actually withstand any damage that they cause. So it's really your young citrus you need to be careful at monitoring. Um, so you can put out traps to indicate when the adults are present and then it'll just clue you into monitoring your leaves much more closely. 
They do like that young new growth. So um, if you're using high nitrogen or fast acting fertilizers, you uh, might attract more citrus leaf miner. And yes, as they, as I said, they don't really um, harm mature trees because mature trees don't push quite as much new growth as younger trees. Um, they are very susceptible to beneficial insects. They have lots of um, enemies. So encouraging some predatory wasps um, and other uh, natural enemies, switching to an organic fertilizer, monitoring with traps and avoid too much pruning. Citrus in um, the Bay Area really should only be pruned two or three times a year. Um, you shouldn't be constantly pruning it. Uh, only it can be pruned in any season except the winter months. So we don't we won't we don't want to make it susceptible to frost. Um, but in the spring after frost, they can they can be pruned. Um, the product Spinosad, which is that Captain Jack's dead bug brew or garden insect spray, that naturally occurring bacteria product, uh, can be used for citrus leaf miner. Though read the label, there are limits on how many times you can apply per year to avoid um, pest um, resistance from growing. And then horticultural oils uh, like neem oil or organocide, which is sesame oil, can be effective as well. White cabbage moth. I have a lot of personal experience with this one, unfortunately. Um, I do grow a lot of kale in my yard. <laughs> and um, white cabbage moth loves the coal crops or the brassicas. So you're going to see a white moth flying around your plants. They are going to lay eggs on those plants and uh, on the leaves. And they're going to, the eggs look like that. The middle photo is what the eggs look like. Little tiny, tiny greens of rice sticking off your leaves. And then when the eggs hatch, the little teeny tiny green caterpillar comes out and munches on those leaves. And they can do a lot of damage really quickly. Um, so um, adults are inactive during the cold months. So if you can um, grow these plants in the winter, then you're going to have better luck. But there are some really simple ways to protect your plants. I personally think that the best thing to do is to just constantly monitor, monitor your plants. It does take a lot of effort. But if you can catch your um, those, those little eggs at the first sign and just wipe them off or smush them, that's gonna um, eliminate a lot of headache for you. Um, once they hatch, the caterpillar comes out super tiny and it is almost the exact same color as a kale leaf, a green kale leaf. So they're super hard to identify. You really have to search underside of the leaves along the veins, you have to really search. So it's a lot easier to get them up in the egg uh, form. You can just wipe them off real quick. Once they do become caterpillars, they do grow quickly. So you'll be able to find them easier, but they also do a lot of damage quite quickly. So if you can pull those caterpillars off, smash them, put them in some soapy water, feed them to your chickens, whatever you want to do, um, that, that hand pulling is going to be quite effective. Other ways to prevent is um, using a row cover, which I, we talked about before. Row cover over your kale and your other brassicas will prevent that moth from flying in and landing on the plant. Um, make sure though, before you put up the row cover that you inspect those plants very um, thoroughly. Because if, you, if they already have larva on them, you're just really creating a nice warm, safe home for them um, and they will just munch away. So constant monitoring will be helpful. Um, Bt, as I mentioned before, is a, um, a bacteria that targets caterpillars. So if you do have caterpillars on your plant, you're gonna wanna spray the Bt on the plant and the, the stalks, like on the leaves and the stalks, because the caterpillar needs to actually ingest the Bt for it to be um, effective. And then there's fungal diseases. Um, like black spot and rust, very common on roses, and rust is very common on a lot of plants. Um, so fungal diseases can cause discoloration, distortion, and premature leaf drop. Black spot and rust don't tend to, they, they, it's unlikely they're going to take down a plant, but with careful 
um, observation monitoring and taking um, some um, action to remove them quickly, you can, you can, um, your plant will survive, <laughs> um, will be fine. And also if we're focusing on the cultural controls of a healthy plant, a healthy plant can actually fight off these fungal diseases if they do arrive. So, um, and also cultural controls is just creating a good environment for your plant, less environment, less good environment for the pest. So that would be avoiding um, moisture, rust, and black spot, and many other fungal diseases like cool to moderate temperatures and moisture and darkness. So we can change the um, environment. We can prune, we're gonna prune um, our plants to allow for airflow and light to enter. That will, that's a cultural control to, um, to avoid too much, um, or to make the you know the habitat undesirable for fungal diseases, um, understanding that many plants are prone to certain diseases, like I said, roses, um, hollyhocks, I think are very um, common with rust and have very commonly have rust. So understanding what plants you have are going to be prone to the diseases, being prepared for it, maybe asking at the nursery for varieties that are um, more resistant. We're always going to clean up and remove the diseased foliage as soon as we see it, um, putting it not in our compost pile. We're going to put it in our green bin or our black bin. We're going to, of course, we're going to ensure airflow. We're going to boost the health of the plant with proper watering and fertilizing. And we're going to avoid overhead watering. That's so I just wanted to share that photo on the top right. That's the looks like a soaker hose underneath mulch. So if you can go for um, drip irrigation or a soaker hose on the soil, or if you're hand watering, just focusing on watering the soil um, instead of the whole plant, because that's going to reduce the amount of moisture on your plant. And then if you do want to try some fungicides, there are some the eco fungicide active ingredients are sulfur, copper soap, neem oil, um, organocide, which is made of sesame oil, and then there are some bacteria that do target fungus. And then powdery mildew is also an extremely common fungus. It is a little bit different than the rest of the fungal diseases because it actually likes dry, warmer conditions. So it likes 60 to 80 degrees and it likes dryness. Uh, water actually inhibits its growth. Um, so to look at it, um, it is similar in a lot of ways that you do want to ensure good airflow, proper watering and fertilizing, um, pruning to allow light and air to enter your plant. Um, but, <clears throat> and um, we're going to avoid synthetic fertilizers because powdery mildew does like that new growth as well. We're always cleaning up our infected leaves um, and anything that falls on the ground because the spores can travel through water and air, or while well, powdery mildew travels through air and wind other fungal spores travel through water. But as I said about the drip irrigation and not overwatering for the other fungal diseases, it's actually kind of the opposite for powdery mildew because powdery mildew likes dryness and watering um, kills the spores. You actually do want to do overhead watering with if you do have powdery mildew um, and uh, but you can do it very carefully. So you can just wash off specific leaves. Um, you can, it's called syringing when you're just washing the leaf. You can even just use like a wet cloth to wipe off leaves. Um, and if you do want to do overhead watering, just make sure that you're watering in the morning so that your plant has the entire day to dry off so that by the time temperatures lower again, the plant will be dry and so it won't be inviting other fungal diseases. So a little bit of a, it's a confusing switch to have to deal with both who like different conditions. And also remembering that powdery mildew doesn't also take down um, most plants and a lot of plants like your cucumbers and your squashes are very susceptible to powdery mildew, but it's not likely to affect your, the fruit growth as long as you're focusing on that healthy soil and that healthy plant with uh, compost and mulch. Um, it's really going to just affect the, the leaf, the leaves, and it might just be aesthetic at some point. Speaking of aesthetics, we're going to talk about weeds. 
So we have, I'll just give you a warning. I think we have three pests left. So just bear with me. I know this is a long one. So we have our weeds and a reminder that weeds are just a plant growing in a place that you don't want it to be. So I have calla lilies growing in my backyard. I didn't really plant them there. They look pretty, I'm okay with them, but sometimes people could consider them weeds, um, for example. But so a weed can be, you know, a veggie start growing in a flower bed because you used compost that had veggie seeds in it. Um, it's really anything you just planted or this is growing where you don't want it to be. But there are invasive species that you do need to be aware of. They can cause problems for wildlife, other native plants, and for humans. So we wanted, we do want to identify and understand um, the, what weeds we do have. Identification is important for weeds because we will understand how they grow, how they reproduce, and that will help us um, with getting rid of them most effectively. Some weeds uh, grow by underground rhizomes and some grow by seeds. So we're gonna wanna make sure that we're aware of that when we're getting rid of them. So ways to manage weeds. Planting more plants that you do want in the yard is always going to reduce the amount of space that your weeds can grow. Um, so we, uh, and it also will shade out any um, ground that is uh, susceptible to weed seeds germinating. If you have weeds in your lawn, you can always choose to cut your lawn a little bit higher because that's the higher lawn is going to shade out weed seed germinating um, on the soil surface. Mulch, as I talked about, is a really great way to just cover the soil surface, not allow any weed seeds to germinate. It does also keep um, any any weeds that grow from underground rhizomes, they're likely to um, not come up or have a harder time coming up through that mulch. Um, and they're also easier to pull actually once if they do pop up through mulch, they're easy to pull. Um, sheet mulching, that picture on the bottom right is a picture of sheet mulching, which involves layers of cardboard and mulch. That is a really effective way to do a few things. If you have a a lawn that you're getting rid of. Um, that's a great way to get rid of the lawn without having to do any too much physical labor of digging it up. Um, that in addition to adding compost will also help your soil, help build healthy soil. You can also use it to get rid of a large area of weeds um, or to prepare your um, like planting area for plants if you do have weeds. A great time, great to do it in the fall. Um, so that by springtime you have nice healthy soil and no weeds in that area to plant them. And they, um, Linkso does talk about sheet mulching on their website as well. Um, as I mentioned, there's also, you know, tons of weeding tools, uh, both uh, manual, the hula hoe on the top, um, or cultivators, hoes, um, pruning tools, and like weed whackers, mowers, all of those things can be used to reduce weeds. If you have weeds in cracks, um, a trick I've learned is to just take a pot of boiling water and pour it right on those weeds in the cracks. It's going to um, uh, explode their little cells so they can't grow anymore. Um, it's not advisable to do that for a large area. We don't want to kill the life in the soil and it's not going to be very effective um, to keep carrying the boiling water out to a large area. But for cracks, it's very effective or a very small area that'll be effective. And if you do need to resort or do want to resort to a chemical control, there are some products out there that have less toxic ingredients. Um, there, the active ingredients are clove oil and citric acid or ammonium nonanoate. Um, that those can be effective for uh, for weeds. It is important though to read the ingredient the instructions on those products because some of them are really only effective for young weeds or above ground parts, and it's not going to kill the the roots or the um, you know any like seeds or nuts. Um, in the soil, so you're going to have to keep applying it. Um, if you do have a persistent, tough, like perennial weed, um, you could try digging it out. That's the best thing to do. And if you can't dig it out, it's recommended that you um, cut it 
as low to the ground as possible, cover it with mulch, and then as any like new suckers or growth comes up, just prune it away um, as best you can. Eventually it will tire and it will stop growing. Rats in the garden, really quickly on this because we did talk about exclusion cages. So rats in the garden, um, the two main things to think about is removing places of harborage, which is where they will live. So burrows, ivy, dense ivy, wood piles, any place that a rat is gonna find a nice safe home, we wanna get rid of it. And then removing their food sources. So don't invite them in to your yard. If there's no food sources for them, they're not gonna come in. So that's um, containing your compost and your chicken coops very securely with quarter inch hardware cloth, keeping your garbage cans really secure, removing any pet food, not free feeding our pets outside. If you do feed your pets outside, allow them to um, eat quickly and then pick up the food when they're done as soon as possible. Definitely not food feeding in the evenings or at nighttime because that's definitely when their rodents are gonna come out. Um, we're gonna avoid bird feeders. As I mentioned, I, don't, I personally don't like bird feeders. They leave a big mess um, and they will attract rodents. Um, and then using exclusion cages, there's these fancy exclusion cages as I've shown you on other slides and this one as well. Um, but you can also be uh, very um, DIY, just using some hardware cloth or um, other, other um, materials to protect your plants. And then last is gophers. So gophers, um, again, if you're in the Bay Area, you're likely to have them. Um, I would be amazed if you haven't already. Gophers, different than moles and voles. Moles um, eat grubs and insects. Um, they don't eat your plants. Voles are more, they do eat, voles do eat your plants a little bit, but they're more kind of surface dwelling. Gophers live underground almost entirely. You might see their head pop up out of the hole just a little bit and they eat plant roots. You can even sometimes see your plants be, you know, start shaking and then can be sucked down into a hole by a gopher. Heartbreaking, but it, it does happen a lot. So, and gophers do create mounds. Um, they, their mounds are, tend to be crescent shaped, although I have to, I live near Golden Gate Park and I see them all the time. I have no way, it doesn't look crescent shaped to me. It's just a mound. <laughs> but um, that's one way to identify between moles and moles and, and gophers. Um, to protect your plants from gophers, the best way to do it is with prevention and always using gopher baskets. They sell gopher baskets in many different sizes. You can even get a tree sized gopher basket. Um, they are made for to protect your plants from gophers. If you are installing raised beds, you should always line the bottom all the way up the side, like you can see in that picture, with half inch hardware cloth. They can't chew through it. Your roots still can get through that hardware cloth, but at that point, like it's okay if the gopher, most plants can withstand gopher damage on the tips of the roots. It's really just that root ball that we don't, that we wanna protect. So, um, that raised bed uh, wire is gonna protect that. There are some repellents out there that have varying degrees of effectiveness. Um, Mole Max is a product made out of castor oil that can be helpful with preventing moles, voles, and gophers. Um, gophers are very persistent. They're very productive. They can make a lot of holes in one day, a lot of tunnels. Um, they are quite tricky. So the more persistent you are with them, the more prevention you do, the less problems you'll have. There also are gopher traps um, that you can stick into the hole. They're just a little tricky. I recommend if you do get them, maybe watch a YouTube video on how to set them because um, they can be a little bit tricky. Um, um, yeah, and then <laughs> I guess just remembering that gophers are food for other animals. So avoiding poison baits is recommended um, because we don't want any, uh, same with rodents as well. We don't want any unintended um, consequences from those poison baits. All right, wrapping up, maintaining your healthy garden, 
We're going to look big picture. Well, really, we're going to look at the garden as an ecosystem. We're going to build healthy soil. The life below the surface of the soil is so important um, for the life above the soil. So we're going to choose um, compost, organic fertilizers, and we're going to mulch where appropriately. We're going to choose the right plants for the right place to have less stressed out plants. We're going to water deeply. Um, and we're gonna adjust our irrigation systems if we have one to the, um, the season, making sure we're, we're adjusting for weather. We're gonna invite in those beneficials and understand the ecosystem that we live in. And we're gonna constantly monitor for pests. And if we do find them, we're gonna properly identify them. And we're gonna address the cause. Uh, why are the pests there? And what can I do to make it a less good environment for them? And here are two more uh, resources for you. Again, the Our Water, Our World website with our fact sheets, our store locations, and um, a list of less toxic products. And the UCIPM website is a super amazing um, website for you. It's mostly for California pests, so I apologize to those who don't live in California, um, but it has it's a wealth of information on every pest in California, and it has this really amazing um, feature. It's, I kind of compare it to a WebMD symptom tracker. So if you have damage on your pest, you can look at the damage, figure out um, from the damage, from the kind of plant, any other signs, uh, you can figure out what could, what could um, that pest possibly be. Very helpful, I use it frequently. And we're gonna wrap up with one poll. So after this webinar, do you feel confident using your steps of integrated pest management um, in your environment? We're gonna give folks about 15 more seconds to uh, share your perspective on this. Okay, I'm going to close the poll. Yay, lots of yeses. That makes me happy. <laughs> Wonderful. Awesome. So with that, um, I just thank you again to Linkso. Thank you to Flows to Bay for having me today. Um, thank you all for being here this afternoon or very early in the morning, depending on where you are in the world. And um, I will, that's my information right there, my email and my Instagram. So you're welcome to reach out to me anytime if you have um, some pest questions or gardening questions. I will do my best to answer them. Um, and we have some time still for questions here. So if you'd like to stick around. And Thank I you, like Charlotte. We, we have quite a few questions in the chat. So I'm gonna go back and address some of them. And Paige, feel free to jump in if I missed some of the questions here, but we'll try to address a good amount here. Um, so going back to aphids, um, um, this, um, person has a lot of aphids on the geraniums and not much sun on the coast. So how can they treat these geraniums and prevent the aphids from taking over next spring? Not much sun on the coast, yeah. Um, uh, I, I, yeah, <laughs> sorry. Um, I would say just focusing on the, I mean, understanding that aphids are gonna probably happen no matter what. So really just kind of deciding what your threshold is. If they're not damaging the plant too much, um, if you can just, you know, spray the, the plant off, uh, the geranium off frequently, it will knock the population back. Um, and focusing on that proper, uh, composting, fertilizing. Geraniums aren't deciduous, so I, was, I can't recommend a dormant spray. Um, but yeah, I would just focus on 
how much can you tolerate? If there's really bad on a few branches, just prune the branches right off and put it in your compost bin. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I don't have too much. I would say just being very consistent with monitoring at the first, um, the first chance you see aphids, spraying them off, spray it off. Or, or if you wanna go for an insecticidal soap, just get rid of them. Alrighty, so we'll move on to a, a different question here. Uh, do we see cicadas around the Bay Area? That's a great question. I don't know. <laughs> I know we hear them. There's quite a, quite a lot of cicadas, but I know if they're they're quite a pest. Um, I personally don't know the answer to that. So I don't I don't know the that answer, and I'm going to write it down so that I can look it up. So thank you. If you do want to follow up with me on that send me an email, whoever asked that question, and I'll, I'll try to look it up. Um, and the next question is, how do you get rid of ants? That's a great question. I don't, I, well, my first question would be, is it outside or inside? But since um, if maybe you can, if you're still here, you can chat that, but I will give you quick both, quick answer for both. Ants, first question is, if they're inside, how are they getting in? Is it, um, you know, find out how they're getting in, add weather stripping, caulk. That's going to be your permanent solution. We do recommend, I recommend bait stations um, using um, a boric acid. Uh, there's the taro eight, bant, eight, ant, wow, ant bait station. I've been talking too long, apparently. Um, ant bait station that um, is very effective with any bait station, though you do need to have some uh, patience, but it does allow the ant to take, go to the bait station and then go back to the colony with the bait. It'll kill the whole colony that way. So that's why it does require a little bit of um, patience. It takes a few days. Um, outside, uh, I don't, well, stop me if they've responded inside or outside, but I will still talk outside. Outside, um, ants are, uh, can be a nuisance and annoying and not super fun, but they are decomposers. They do work the soil. They decompose organic matter. They aerate the soil. They allow, you know, for, for air, water, and roots to infiltrate. So they're not necessarily pests outdoors. The only time that they can be pests um, outdoors is how we discussed when they are interfering with beneficial insects um, getting the, the food. So ladybugs on aphids or uh, white flies because ants will protect those insects. So in that case, definitely we want to take action, hosing them off, um, wiping them off using a, a sticky insect barrier or an outdoor ant bait station. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is, I'm, I'm just sort of going back here. Um, I'm guessing this question sort of refers to the um, biocides that are organics. And um, they're asking, does that mean that they're safe for organic garden vegetables, such as beet greens, um, especially after they have dried? So they have aphids on the beet greens. So using, you know, uh, sprays and stuff, I'm assuming, and feel free to jump in in the chat and correct me if I'm wrong, um, is I'm guessing it's a spray that you use to get rid of um, aphids. Would that affect the, the beet greens and root vegetables, essentially? Um, no, they're, if you're using an eco um, like a soap or an oil, or like a bio, like a bacteria, um, it's not going to hurt your veggies. You can still eat them. Definitely, I mean, rinse your veggies, of course, as you would anyway. Um, but as long as you've given it time to um, dry on the plant, so I, I mean, definitely don't spray and then harvest it <laughs> immediately. Give it a couple of days to dry and do what it do what it needs to do. Um, but yeah, it should be, it will be fine for you as long as you just rinse your, your veggies. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so th there are a couple questions regarding this. Are there any apps to identify pests? And I know I shared the UC and a and website there and IPM. 
Um, but are there any apps that you know of that you can share with us? That's a great question. I've had that before. I was just told about this one awesome one, but it's like $30 a month. And of course I forgot the name <laughs> uh, when the price might be a little prohibitive anyway. Um, I know that there is a app called iNaturalist that helps at least identify plants. There might be some that can help there might be a feature in it. I don't use it, but I think there's probably a feature that um, helps with pests as well. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, Paige, can, do you know of any apps that help with pest ID? I don't know any others. I'm not aware of any, but I do know that like folks who are well-versed in integrated pest management um, could like help you identify um, what could be going on with your garden. Another, uh, actually that reminds me, thank you Paige, if you have a pest question and you, you can either reach out to me or another IPM advocate with our Water our World, or you can always reach out to your local master gardeners. Um, they usually have a hotline or like an email that you can always ask them for advice as well, um, helping identify. Thank you. Um, I know you addressed this briefly, but how can people control slugs? Could you just go over it very quickly? I know we talked about snails. Yeah, um, snails and slugs are very similar. They like um, darkness, moisture, so they will come out at night generally. So if you can go out at night with a headlamp um, and inspect your plants, physically pulling them off the plant and putting them in some soapy water or smashing them or feeding, to your, feeding them to your chickens or ducks is a great, um, just that's a great simple way to get rid of them. Um, uh, you can prune some plants to avoid too much like shade. They like to hide under certain plants because um, it just offers shade and darkness. Um, and watering earlier in the day, just like I mentioned for the fungal diseases, um, watering early in the day will allow your plants and your soil to dry out a little bit more to be less um, attractive to snails and slugs. Um, and there is a product, Sluggo or any iron phosphate bait is um, pretty effective and safe when using them in the garden. There is a, I don't actually, they probably don't even sell it anymore, but there used to be sold in, in, in ingredient called metaldehyde, which I think was taken off, probably taken off the shelves because it was really toxic to dogs. So avoid metaldehyde, but an iron phosphate bait um, can be effective. Thank you. Uh, this is actually a really great question. Um, how do the organizations who collect the leftover pesticides get rid of them? That's an awesome question. And thank you. I had that question recently and I finally asked a contact that I have in San Francisco. And unfortunately, I think what happens is basically they collect them and they send them elsewhere and they get incinerated, which is kind of a horrifying thought, but it's really the only way to get rid of them, I guess, with less, um, you know, less toxic byproducts. I don't even want to know what the incineration of pesticides leads to, but I'm sure they do it in a very safe way. Mm -hmm. and probably far away from civilization. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so this question is related to the one that you had proposed, the iron phosphate. Are they pretty toxic to ground insects like barn bees or worms or any microbiology uh, within the soil? That's a good question. Iron phosphate bait is pretty, um, it's really, um, it's a molluscicide or something. It's only for snails and slugs. Um, so that's only going to harm them. There is um, a product, Sluggo Max, I think, or Sluggo Plus, I don't remember which one it is, that also has um, spinosad in it. That can also take care of certain ground-dwelling insects, uh, pests, insect pests like roly-polies and sow bugs. Um, so you could, if you have both, you can use that as well. Um, but no, the iron phosphate is really only for snails and slugs. Okay. And does sluggo kill um, earthworms? 
Do you no. know? No. Okay. Not that I know of. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's a, I like these people that are very concerned. This is wonderful. <laughs> Good questions to ask. Um, and the next question is, how do you use neem oil for pests? I have my own thoughts on it, but I, I, I'd like to hear yours first. Okay. I would like to hear yours also. <laughs> so, um, neem oil is tricky because it um, is a broad spectrum insecticide or pesticide because it can kill um, insects, mites, and fungal diseases. So I would recommend if you're using neem, you're spraying it very carefully because it has um, some unintended consequences. It can be somewhat toxic to bees actually, and I'm think there is a question, I'm not sure, about its toxicity to birds. So um, I would treat it like any pesticide spraying very carefully, only where you need it, late in the, um, in the afternoon or yeah, dusk time. Um, and um, yeah, that's all I have. <laughs> Ken, yeah. Ken, what's your thoughts? Well, it's great. Yeah, that, that same, Charlotte. That's, I, I have a, a love-hate relationship with neem oil. It's fantastic to get rid of really, really um, uh, uh, resilient pests, I would say. However, you sort of want to be careful uh, not to overuse everything in moderation, right? So especially don't let neem oil um, really drip down into the soil. It does affect soil biology. So I, I, I tend to dilute it even um, past the dilution rate um, to use the neem for aphids or whatever you're using it for. Um, there is neem seed meal um, that you can add to the soil, uh, which is a high nitrogen fertilizer, in fact. Um, interesting, interesting product. And I've had several clients that said um, great things about it. Um, as far as um, neem seed meal being counterproductive in terms of growing soil microbiology, I'm not so sure. So, you know, um, everything in moderation. <laughs> yeah, I was reading that the label on the neem seed uh, meal and it's mostly advertised as a fertilizer. Mm -hmm. um, and it does have some effect on certain soil dwelling pests, but um, it's unclear um, what other pests might be affected by it or when what other beneficial insects might be affected by it. So yes, exactly. Moderation is great. All right. So the next question is, how do you encourage parasitic wasps? And I know uh, parasitic wasps are great for aphid control. So um, I would just say more diversity because the more diverse plants, you're going to invite more diverse insects, um, both above and below the ground too. Actually, I should point out diversity above the ground equals diversity below. Um, so I don't specifically know what plants that they like, um, but if you go, I would bet that that Rincon Vitova mm -hmm. um, website has really extensive um, information about specific types of wasps, flies, and other um, predators and how to attract each of them. Absolutely. I'm just going to give a little plug for Rincon Vitova again, and they're a great resource. Um, they, you can just call them or email them if you have any pest issues, and they'll recommend a beneficial um, pest management solutions for that. And there's so many different species, so talk to them. I know very little <laughs> about pest control and, and, and buying beneficials through mail, but they are a great, great resource. Um, with that said, I think, Paige, did I miss any uh, pertinent IPM questions in the chat? And if so, feel free to jump in. But I, I think we pretty much addressed a lot of the questions um, that were asked. If anyone else has any specific questions, feel free to chat. We have about five, 10 more minutes. We can address them. Yeah, I didn't see any that you had missed. But again, folks, if you have last questions, go ahead. Oh, oh there's one. Uh, would powdery mildew be found on rosebuds? 
Um, yeah, I think it can be found on the buds sometimes, but it, it usually starts on the leaves. So if you catch it early, um, you can reduce the chances of it moving to the buds as well. It does slow the growth um, and it might distort the buds um, a little bit. Um, but again, if you, um, if you, uh, you know, take the actions quickly and are constantly monitoring, you can usually uh, reduce the overall um, damage to your plant. Okay, thank you. Um, this one, I think I missed this when I saw this earlier in the chat, but how do you get rid of, or what, what are the good, uh, what are some ways to get rid of Colorado potato beetles? Yeah, I see that question and I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I will look it up. If uh, you would like to email me that question, I will gladly do the research. I love doing research because it's how I learn. Um, but I, have, I don't I don't know about Colorado potato beetles. I, I, would, I would probably refer them to UC Davis IPM pest notes. Uh, they probably have something regarding that. Um, I don't particularly remember, but uh, that's a good resource and page. Maybe you can type that into the chat again. Um, I think it, if you scroll up, it's, it's included up there, but um, we can just share it with them again. Well, it looks like um, we're just about to wrap up here. Any closing thoughts, um, comments, um, please feel free to chat in. But um, if not, I just want to thank uh, Paige from uh, Flows to Bay and Charlotte from uh, Our Water, Our World for giving us a wonderful pre presentation today. And um, we all learned something. And thank you again to you both. Thank you. Thanks everyone for sticking around and taking the time. And we'll we'll go ahead and email you a recorded link of the of the class today. And Paige also chatted in information about the raffle. Uh, please do take the survey if you're able to, and you'll be entered into a raffle for um, two different gift cards. So thank you again. Thank you. Thanks everyone.